Diyos. Maraming salamat po sa buhay at lakas na aming taglay. Sa liwanag ng kaisipan at sa pagkakataon, maipagpatuloy ang pag-aaral ng mga kabataan. Gabay mo po ang bawat isa sa amin. Ano man ang bahagi na nagagampanan, naway maging maayos at matagumpay ang pagtuturo at pag-aaral na aming gagawin sa araw na ito. Patawarin mo po kami sa aming mga pagkulang at pagkakasala. At sa aming pagawa, ikaw po ang aming makasama. Amen. Good day, grade 12 students. This is Jasper Angeles, your live stream teacher for 21st century literature from the Philippines and the world. We shall be embarking once again on a trip bound for the treasures of 21st century writings. Before we do that, make sure that you have your pen and your notebook. Do not forget to take down notes while listening. Last time class, we have used our understanding of context in interpreting literature. Can you comment down the four contexts that we have used in interpreting literary texts? What were the texts that we have discussed last meeting? Come on, let me see if you can still remember them. Alright, the four contexts are biographical, linguistic, literary, and sociocultural contexts. The texts that we have explored on the other hand were Rhythmic Exercise by Mohamed Maksangi and Immigration Headline by Javier Zamora. Both texts were written in the 21st century and both also show the issues that we humans face in this century, which are political issues resulting in uprisings and of course, human displacement. Now, we shall add to those world issues by looking at other literary pieces coming from the world. To better prepare us for those issues, let us answer some questions that you may or you may not know the answer to. Nevertheless, let us test your knowledge of world issues and general information through these questions. I would not ask, of course, if you are ready because you have no choice but to be ready. Let's begin. Class, the first one is this. What do you call the condition in which there is a discrepancy between the internal and external sexual and genital organs? It is grouped together with other conditions as a disorder of sex development or DSD. Is it letter A, homosexuality, B, hermaphroditism, C, transgenderism, or letter D, heterosexuality? You have 10 seconds to answer. Timer starts now. What is your answer? Class, this condition is called letter B, hermaphroditism. A hermaphrodite or intersex person is someone who has some or all of the primary sex characteristics of both genders, for example, a penis and vulva. There are three types of hermaphrodites, true male pseudo and female pseudo. A true hermaphrodite is someone who has both ovary and testicular tissue. Believe it or not, there are people who suffer from this condition class, being a male and female at the same time. They are not people who are gay, bisexual, or lesbian, however. Like you, they are also humans. Let's have the next question. What ideology is associated with the idea that if a man does not play basketball, does not fall in love with a woman, or does not do any activities pertaining to the ones expected from a typical man, then he is not a man. Is it letter A, progressivism, B, conservatism, C, homosexuality, or letter D, patriarchy? 
Come on, 10 seconds, go! What's your answer? The correct answer class is letter D, patriarchy. It is a social system or as a social system in which men hold primary power and predominate in roles of political leadership, moral authority, social privilege, and control of property. Patriarchy is an ideology that forced men to embrace the toxic masculinity stereotypes like the ones mentioned here. Remember grade 12, you do what you want, not on the basis of stereotypes, but on the basis of your own preference. To young boys out there who don't play basketball, you're still men. Games do not define your gender. No one and nothing can define who you are because that is what you choose for yourself. So much about gender class. Let's have the next question. Class, it is the sense of a nation as a cohesive whole, as represented by distinctive traditions, culture, and language. It is viewed in psychological terms as an awareness of difference, a feeling, and recognition of we and they. Is it letter A, cultural awareness? B, colonial mentality? C, I, uh, national identity? Or letter D, collective identity? Timer's on! What do you think is the correct answer? It is actually letter C, national identity. Let's have our fourth question, shall we? You are a Chinese citizen intending to go to the U.S. If you move to the United States permanently, what would you be considered to China? Is it letter A, immigrant? B, immigrant? C, refugee, or letter D, expatriate. Go and comment your answers. What is your answer, class? Alright, the correct answer is actually letter B. Emigrant. Emigration is the movement of individuals out of an area. Emigrate is from the point of view of the departure. You are an emigrant to the country where you came from and an immigrant to the country you are to go to. An expatriate, meanwhile, is a person who lives outside their native country. Now, let's have the last question. In literature class, it is an imagined community or society that is dehumanizing and frightening. Its role is to educate and give awareness to the audience. It also serves as a warning about the current state of affairs of a government or of those in power. Is it letter A, dystopia, B, utopia, C, generative community, or letter D, hunter-gatherer society? Go and comment your answer. What is your answer? The correct one is, of course, dystopia. This genre class by content is shared by famous novels of today like Hunger Games, Divergent, and The Maze Runner. Now, from the short series of questions, what other social issues besides the ones we have explored last meeting have you encountered? Can I see them on the comment section? What issues here were introduced? Okay, I see several answers, but I do believe that we can summarize them into four. We have dystopian literature as genre, gender issues, political problems, and again, human displacement. 
These, however, are not the only things you will encounter in the selected texts that you will see later. There are other several pressing issues in the 21st century. Before we begin, however, let's be guided by the following objectives. First class, you need to be able to identify the canonical works from the world, and secondly, explore the various themes evident in the given canonical literary works from the world. Class, if you can still remember the third episode, we clarified the confusion on the module regarding literary genres on the 21st century. We do not have emerging genres according to form. We cannot guarantee also that we have emerging content because some of them were evident already in the past. Some say that we have novels having technology as subject matter. If this is the case, class, how would you explain the novels of H.G. Wells, especially The Time Machine, which was written in the 19th century? What uh, we do have in the 21st century, I think, are the different modes of publication. Of course, there are still issues of the present that did not emerge in the days of yore. This is the reason why we can also say that in terms of content, 21st century literature also explores national, ethnic, linguistic, and socio-political issues like identity and diaspora, which are both side effects of the two major world wars we have experienced in the past centuries. Given that literature is written in the 2000s onwards reflect significant human experiences as a result, of changes in political, economic, and societal landscapes can we consider them as a classic or as a canonical work? If you have seen in our objective, one of our goals is to see the canonical works. The question now is, what makes a literary work canonical or at least classical? How do we know if the contemporary works we have read and we are about to read are canonical? First, what do we mean by canon or canonical work? Class, canonical literary works are not captured by canon cameras. They are not also related with canons of the medieval era. Literary canon refers to a body of books, narratives, and other texts considered to be the most important and, look at this, influential of a particular time, period, or place. Remember the term influential. An influential work is something that aroused the public, something that made them react in the same way that the friars reacted to results Nolly and LTV. Of course, they were influential because they covered the life of people and sometimes they touch on the controversial issues commonly hurting some people who hold power. Not all literary canons have done this, of course, but we are sure that they have influenced people. Furthermore, in the earliest years, most educators were religious and ultimately brought in a moral focus or moral compass in terms of which works were approved as canonical works. According to Stephen Behrens, university professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the Western literary canon has historically been dictated by economically secure, traditionally educated, socially privileged white men. This means to say that the canonical status of a work is often politicized. Also, he mentioned that canons are always about closed communities. Who is excluded is at least as important as who is included. It is the word in crowd that usually controls the entrances which means that the canonized or canonical writers largely resemble those who have judged them to be major or important or classic. But this judging still rests on the tastes and preferences of the judges who have traditionally been conditioned whether they are aware of it to certain or to prefer certain things, familiar things mostly over unfamiliar ones. This mainly tells us that both politics and the people decide how a literary text becomes a canonical work. This class is supported by Italo Calvino in the text Why Read the Classics, published in 1991. According to Calvino, one of the criteria to a classic is that it must exercise a particular influence both when they imprint themselves on our imagination as unforgettable 
and when they hide in the layers of memory disguised as the individuals or collective unconscious. He also adds that a classic is a work that has never exhausted all it has to say to its readers. This means to say that each time you read that text, another epiphany or insight gets discovered by you. Each time you read it, you see another point of view, another relatable experience class. With these points, I believe everyone has gotten the idea as to how the title canonical and classical is attached to the name of a novel, short story, or poem. Now, let's take a short trip to the various literary works of the world that we can consider as canonical. Do not expect, however, that we will be able to cover all of them. In our session today, we will get a glimpse of some authors, their works, and the issues they have captured from the 21st century. By the way, we have used these references here, as you can see here, as basis for the selection of the canonical literary pieces from the world. Remember, class, that a canonical literary work is an influential work, and the text that we shall see later had been recognized by a lot of readers around the world. These texts came from these regions, Asia and the Pacific, Europe, North America, and Central and Latin America. Mind you that this is not Miss Universe. Okay, so we still had these regions, of course. Let's begin with the canonical works from Asia. Again, class, remember that we consider these works as canonical because of their international recognition that we can read in the articles that we have shown a while ago. Let us begin with Illustrado by Miguel Sihuko. Miguel was born and raised in Manila. A novelist, journalist, and teacher, he is a contributing opinion writer for the International New York Times. Sihuko's novel begins with a body. On a clear day in winter, the battered corpse of Crispin Salvador is pulled from the Hudson River. Gonzu is the only manuscript of his final book, a work meant to rescue him from obscurity by exposing the crimes of the Filipino ruling families. Miguel, his student and only remain, remaining friend, sets out for Manila to investigate. The writing emerged as a rich and dramatic family saga of four generations tracing 150 years of Philippine history forged under Spanish, American, and Filipinos themselves. Si Huko uses numerous parallels, including the parallel between Crispin and Miguel, to show the past repeating itself in the present. This novel basically tells its audience of the possibilities of a repeated history and of the power of the younger generation to stop that culture perpetuated in the past. Next, we have Three Sisters by B. Fei Yu. From the Philippines, let's jump to China. V. Fei Yu is one of the most respected authors and screenwriters in China today. He was born in 1964 in Tsinghua in the province of Jiangsu, China. B. constructs um, well-rounded characters and is often called China's best male writer on the female psyche. He often writes like he talks. His prose can be mindering and his metaphors indulgent. But his ability to reproduce colloquial language in print and his interest in commonplace characters means that his work presents a wealth of truly relevant detail to the reader. B. Feiyu is among a generation of writers whose memories have been shaped as much by China's tumultuous 20th century history which weathered revolution and the rise of communism, as by the seismic societal shifts caused by the post-1980s economic growth. This novel, Three Sisters, focuses on the separate stories of three sisters to show the effects of these shifts on individuals caught amidst sweeping historical change. In a small village in China, the Wang family has produced seven sisters in its quest to have a boy. Three of the sisters emerged as the lead characters in this remarkable novel. Born in an impoverished rural hinterland, the Wang family find their lives dominated by the unspoken rules of patriarchal customs. Sons are valued over daughters, and a young woman's only hope for advancement is a good match. 
They, the sisters, strive to change the course of their destinies and battle against an infinite ocean of people in China that does not truly belong to them. Yumi will use her dignity, Yushi, her powers of deduction, and Yu Yang, her ambition, all in an effort to take control of their world, their bodies, and their lives. Although the three sisters are rewarded for their perseverance in an overwhelmingly uh, misogynistic society, their small gains are easily outrun by their misfortunes. What social issues class were present here? Yes, I'd agree it tells something about misogyny, if not the perpetuation of the patriarchal ideology in this context. Let's see our next author in peace. Here we meet Aravind Adiga and his work, The White Tiger. Aravind or Aravind Adiga was born in India in 1974 and educated in India and Australia. He studied English literature at Columbia University in New York and gained a master's in philosophy at Magdalene College, Oxford. Since 2000, he has worked as a journalist, first as a financial correspondent in New York, then returning to India in 2003 to work as correspondent for Time magazine. His articles on politics, business, and the arts have appeared in many publications. The White Tiger was published in 2008 and won the 2008 Man Booker Prize for Fiction. It takes the form of a series of unsent letters to the Chinese premier from Balram, Hawaii, a murderer who left his village to work as a chaffer in Delhi. By the time he sits down to tell his story, Balram, the protagonist, is a wealthy man who keeps to himself steer fear fearful that one day his crime will be discovered. However, he concludes in his letter to Wen Jibao, claiming that even if he is found, he will never regret his crime. It was worth committing, according to him, simply because it enabled him to experience life as a free man rather than as a servant. But Ram's eyes penetrate India as few outsiders can. The cockroaches and the call centers, the prostitutes and the worshippers, the ancient and old internet cultures, the water buffalo, and trapped in so many kinds of cages that escape is almost impossible, the white tiger. And with the charisma as undeniable as it is expected, Balram teaches us that religion doesn't create virtue and money doesn't solve every problem. Aside from these Filipino, Chinese, and Indian texts, we also have the Garden of Evening Mists by Tan Tuan Eng. It is a second English language novel by Malaysian novelist Tan Tuan Eng, first published in January 2012. The book follows protagonist T. Yun Ling, who was a prisoner of the Japanese during the World War II and later became a judge overseeing war crime cases. Many of the characters here face the psychological and physical effects of war. The effects vary from one person to another, but it's clear that everyone pays a price. Theme? Well, uh, colonialism is not the only thing that had its lasting effect last. That Second World War was or had its effect in our lolos and lolas, who had experienced the horrors of Japanese invasion. Speaking of Japan, the next author is a Japanese. Haruka Rakami and uh, one of his novels, IQ84. This work is a dystopian science fiction novel. Bearing a title reminiscent of George Orwell's 1984, Murakami's novel leads readers into a version of reality in which time and space have splintered. A remarkable genre by content in the 21st century dystopia was evident in this novel. Just like what I've told you, we can only cover much in this learning session. I hope that your subject teacher would help you discover more literary texts and authors in the 21st century. To do that, look for well-known books and see the themes they present. The important thing is that you understand the subject matter it explores. Next on our list class are the European authors and their works. First, we have The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Steg Larsson. Larsson Klaas was a Swedish journalist and writer. He is best known for writing the Millennium Trilogy of crime novels 
which were published posthumously. For much of his life, Larson lived and worked in Stockholm. His journalistic work covered socialist politics, and he acted as an independent researcher of the right-wing extremism. The novel, his novel, begins with journalist Michael Blomqvist, fresh from being convicted from libeling a wealthy Swedish uh, financer who is hired by an elderly industrialist to find out who murdered his niece more than 40 years earlier. He joins uh, forces with Lisbeth Allender, a young woman with multiple tattoos and piercings, but all talent for hacking into people's computers, and the two find themselves tracking a serial killer who has murdered women for several decades. On the surface, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is a simple mystery thriller, but on a deeper level, the book is an examination of the violent abuse of women in Sweden, focusing primarily on the rap philosophies and governmental failures that permit such acts. This theme manifests most graphically in chapters 11 and 13 of the novel, Fort Guardian's Neil Yurman forces Salander to perform a sexual act in exchange for access to her finances and brutally rapes her. As Salander reflects on the first sexual assault in chapter 12, she comes to a distinct conclusion that authorities rarely punish assaults against women and that women rarely report them because violence against women occurs as an accepted part of their society. Imagine that. Salander's experiences bolster this view and convince her that the only effective solution to society's complacency is for women to empower themselves. I have to ask you the social issue present in the text. To see if you have the same idea with mine, comment that social issue in the comment box. While you do that, let's look at a dissertation by Jenny Erbeck. Jenny was born in East Berlin in 1967. From 1988 to 1990, Erbeck studied theater at the Humboldt University of Berlin. Later on, she also started a writing career in addition to her directing. Using the perspective of inhabitants, servants, and visitors, Irvin Beck in novel reconstructs the history of a summer lake house located one hour southeast of Berlin in the state of Brandenburg. One house, three families, five generations. The novel condenses the insanity of a century of German history from the Weimar Republic of the 1920s to the post reunification years. The inhabitants of the lake house appear and disappear, just like the great ideologies of the time. The only constant in this world is the gardener. He is simply there and does what a gardener simply has to do. Silently and without a question, just like nature. At the end comes the demolition with waste disposal according to legal guidelines. And then the landscape, if ever, so briefly resembles itself once more. A new cycle can begin in this thousand-year landscape of woods and water. So what is the theme or what theme is evident in this German novel? Of course, it talks about impermanence. But again, if you have other ideas on the theme, comment them on the comment box. Right now, let's see Atonement by Ian McEwan. Class, I'd like you to research on the biography of McEwan. During your follow-up discussion, share what you have found about McEwan. Class Atonement is a 2001 British metafiction novel by Ian uh, McEwan. Set in three time periods, 1935 England, Second World War England and France, and present-day England, it covers an upper-class girl's half-innocent mistake that ruins lives, her adulthood in the shadow of, an, of that mistake, and a reflection on the nature of writing. Similar to that Asian text a while ago, this talks or this novel talks of the events that happened after World War II. This only proves our point that the Second World War, being one of the two major wars in the world history, has indeed influenced the way we live in the 21st century. Do you love animals? Do you love them more than humans? If you do, then you will love this novel by Olga Tokarczuk. Awarded the 2018 Nobel Prize in Literature to Karczuk from Poland is particularly noted for her mythical tone of writing. 
Driver flow over the bones of the dead begins with a remote Polish village where the protagonist Janina devotes the dark winter days to studying astrology, translating the poetry of William Blake, and taking care of summer homes of wealthy Warsaw residents. Her reputation as a crank and a recluse is amplified by her not-so-secret preference for the company of animals over humans. To know more about this text class, I suggest that you read it somewhere later after the live stream session. Again, class, those are only some of the European texts that we can consider canonical in the 21st century. Now, let's explore the 21st century texts coming from Africa. We begin with Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda Nyozi Adichie. Adichie, class, is a Nigerian writer whose works range from novels to short stories to nonfiction. She was described in the Times the Tri Supplement as the most prominent uh, of a procession of critically acclaimed young Anglophone authors, which is succeeding in attracting a new gen generation of readers to African literature, particularly in her second home, the United States. This text humanizes those who fall victims to war and shows a side of war that is often ignored in the name of nationalism. After Biafra announced that it would secede, a civil war follows and irreversibly changes the lives of the characters in the text. The book traces the events that shook Africa during the early and late 1960s and the period when the war took place. The novel takes a beautifully anachronistic approach, flowing back and forth in time to tell the tale of those affected by war. Nigeria became independent from Great Britain in 1960. The Nigerian Biafra Civil War lasted from 1967 to 1970 and was marked by extreme starvation and ethnic violence. Ethnic tensions fostered by the British played a major role in the war. The major or the majority of eastern Nigeria was comprised of Igbo peoples and this area seceded to create Biafra. Alright, it seems that we have come across another text discussing the role of war in the events of the 21st century, right? This being the third literary piece about the same motif, we can agree, or with this uh, same literary piece with the same motif, we can agree that the 21st century literature seems to be reflective of the past and its influence on the present time. Going back to its effects, however, colonialization and war have also led to diaspora. This has been the interest of our next author, who is Alain Mabanku. Mabanku, a novelist, journalist, poet, and academic, is a French citizen born in the Republic of Congo and is currently a professor of literature at UC LA. He is best known for his novels and nonfiction writing depicting the experience of contemporary Africa and the African diaspora in France. Class, what does diaspora mean? Diaspora refers to any group that has been dispersed outside its traditional homeland. Broken Glass, the protagonist of the novel, seems to uh, be experiencing diaspora mentally. Set in a sad sack Congolese bar called Credit Gone West, this ingeniously satirical novel by the Congolese poet and novelist creates a microcosm of post-colonial African experience through the tales of sodden bar patrons. Broken Glass, a 64-year-old former teacher who renounced a conventional life for drinking life, jots down his and other stories in a notebook given to him by the bar's owner, Stubborn Snail. Babanku moves fluidly from story to story, struggling sentences together without periods and settling into a pleasing prose rhythm. Yeah, I know. That's quite a short discussion to cover the literature of Africa class. But I know that your thirst for knowledge would trigger you to use the internet and search bar for more. Also, I'm sure that your subject teachers will do their best to fill in the gaps in this learning session. For now, let's see the literatures coming from the Central and Latin America. Let us begin by Juno Diaz and his novel, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. He is a Dominican-American writer, creative writing professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, 
and fiction editor at Boston Review. He also serves on the Board of Advisors for Freedom University, a volunteer organization in Georgia that provides post-secondary instruction to undocumented immigrants. The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde recounts the life of a title character whose real name is Oscar de Leon. Oscar is a Dominican-American who grew up in Patterson, New Jersey and struggled his whole life to find community, a sense of identity, and above all, love. Junior, who was Oscar's college roommate, serves as the novel's primary narrator. Interspersed through uh, the account of Oscar's life, Junior recalls stories of how Oscar's mother and grandfather suffered under the regime of the Dominican dictator Trujillo. If that's about experiences in a dictatorial form of government like the ones that we have experienced during the Marcos regime, the novel 2666 or 2666 by Roberto Bolaño brings us back to the effect of the World War II. Bolaño was a Chilean novelist, short story writer, poet, and essayist. In 1999, Bolaño won the Romulo Gallegos Prize for his novel Lost Detectives Salvajes or The Savage Detectives. And in 2008, he was posthumously awarded the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction for his novel 2666, which was described by board member Marcelo Aldez as a work so rich and dazzling that it will surely draw readers and scholars for ages. The New York Times described him as the most significant Latin American literary voice of his generation. Imagine that. So, 666 is the last novel of Roberto Bolaño. It was released in 2004, a year after Bolaño's death. Its themes are manifold, and it revolves around an elusive German author and the unsolved and ongoing murders of women in Santa Teresa, violent scene inspired by Ciudad Juarez, and its epidemic of female homicides. In addition to Santa Teresa, settings and themes include the Eastern Front in World War II, the academic world, mental illness, journalism, and the breakdown of relationships and careers. 2666 explores 20th century degeneration through a wide array of characters, locations, time periods, and stories within stories. The two previous texts had been written as fiction. This book written by Valeria Uselli is an essay. This means to say that this is an account of real-life events. Valeria Uselli is a Mexican author living in the United States. She is the author of the book of essays, Sidewalks, and the novel Faces in the Crowd, which won the Los Angeles Times Art Sadenbaum Award for First Fiction. In the book Tell Me How It Ends by uh, Lucia Lee, uh, she translates and asks undocumented Latin American children facing deportation. The text humanizes these young immigrants or migrants and highlights the contradiction between the idea of America as fiction for immigrants and the reality of racism and fear both here and back home. The social issue presented here seems to be familiar, right? Another text discussing immigrants. Let's proceed with the last region, the North America. I only picked two uh, texts here, one from Canada and one from the United States. Folks, here's Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. Margaret Eleanor Atwood is a Canadian poet, novelist, literary critic, essayist, teacher, environmental activist, and inventor. Oryx and Crake features speculative fiction and adventure romance rather than the pure science fiction because it does not deal with things we can't yet do or begin to do, yet goes beyond um, the amount of realism associated with the novel form. It focuses on a lone character called Snowman who finds himself in a bleak situation with only creatures called Quakers to keep company or to keep him company. The reader learns of his past as a boy called Jimmy and of genetic experimentation and pharmaceutical engineering that occurred under the purview of Jimmy's peer, Glenn Craig. What 21st century genre by content is evident here in this novel? Of course, I know the answer, but I'd like to see your answers also. 
Next, we have Middle Sex by Jeffrey Eugenides. Eugenides is an American novelist and short story writer. He has written numerous short stories and essays as well as three other novels. The Virgin Suicides served as basis of the feature film while Middle Sex received the, the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Primarily a coming-of-age story or Bildungsroman and family saga, Middle Sex chronicles the effect of a mutated gene on three generations of a Greek family causing momentous changes in the protagonist's life. According to scholars, the novel's main themes are nature versus nurture, rebirth, and the different experiences of what society constructs as polar opposites, such as those found between men and women. It discusses the pursuit of the American dream and explores gender identity. The novel contains many allusions to a uh, uh, Greek mythology, including creatures such as Minotaur, half man and half bull, and the Chimera, a monster composed of various animal parts. There are other several texts exploring sexuality and gender. This is because this is part of the identity development theme, a motif that recurs in contemporary texts. Again, we have considered these literary pieces and authors from the different regions of the world as canonical literary pieces and canonical writers because of the recognitions and accolades that they have received. This tells us that they have influenced the political and social scene we see in the 21st century. With regards to them being a classic, however, I do believe that we have to wait and see if they stand or will stand the test of time. Again, what were the salient features that made these literary texts we discussed as canonical works? Again, what made them canonical works class? What were some of the salient features? I'd like to hear two salient features from you. Okay, so as you can see on the PowerPoint presentation, all of them had been influential in the 21st century and had presented significant human experiences that make us more human in the process. Again, influence and significant human experiences. Do not forget the two concepts or these two concepts related with canonical works. In our next live stream session, we shall be exploring literary text and use again context and literary approaches to see different perspectives and interpretation of literary texts. The goal, of course, is to deduce the themes that help us understand the world and ourselves in the process. Once again, this is your live stream teacher, Jasper Angeles. See you next time!